World War II was the deadliest war in history, far deadlier than that Thai food you ate for dinner last night. Low estimates of casualties start around 70 million, nearly twice the number of lives lost in World War I. High estimates of casualties reach nearly 120 million, or twice the entire population of Italy. Entire cities were destroyed and engulfed by despair. Disease and starvation tore through entire armies. We've all been taught the basics of World War II, unless maybe you live here, or here, or here. But here are things that history books didn't tell you about the war to end all wars. The man who fought on every side. What kind of traitorous, backstabbing person fights on both sides of a war? How about a guy who fought on three sides? Well, I guess it was really two sides. A bit of ally, a bit of Axis, but then he technically fought for three countries and wound up living in a fourth. And rather than some Game of Thrones story of treachery and treason, it actually turned out to be one of incredible survival and resourcefulness. The man we're talking about is a Korean named Yang Kyun Jong. When Yang was 18, he was forced to enlist in the Japanese army. Korea was under Japanese control from 1910 until, well, you know, Nagasaki and Hiroshima happened. In 1939, Yang fought with the Japanese against the Soviets in the Battle of Kalkin Gol, but then was captured and sent to a gulag in Siberia. He survived the gulag, and when the Soviets needed manpower, they started sending their prisoners to the front lines to fight. How effective these fighters were is questionable, but then again, if they retreated, they were shot, so they were actually pretty much stuck between the business ends of two rifles. Yang ended up fighting for the Soviets against the Germans in 1942, after they invaded the Soviet Union during Operation Barbarossa. He became a prisoner of war yet again, this time after the Battle of Kharkov. But then the Germans stuck him in a Nazi uniform and sent him off to fight in France, where he was eventually captured by U.S. paratroopers shortly after D-Day in June of 1944. He checked into a yet another prison camp, this time in Britain, and then was transferred to another one in the U.S. The guy really sampled all the POW camps one man could ask for. His story would have a happy ending, though. He was released, eventually gained U.S. citizenship, and lived out the rest of his life in the United States. But like a lot of good stories, this one might be made up. Despite several prominent historians saying that Yang was indeed a real person, a 2005 South Korean documentary about him concluded that there wasn't enough convincing evidence that he actually existed. There are some unverified photos of him, but that's about it. True or not, the title of his story should probably be You Caught Me instead of Catch Me If You Can. Japan's Death Ray You know, long before George Lucas conjured up the Death Star on the silver screen, the Japanese were hoping to create one of their own. The idea of a Death Ray began to be theorized back in the 20s and 30s. Japan's version was inspired by none other than Nikola Tesla, who in addition to reportedly being deeply in love with a pigeon, was working on all kinds of mad sciencey stuff that was way ahead of its time. Japan's government reportedly doled out over 1 million yen to a team of scientists in the hopes of creating a super-powered death ray that they nicknamed Kugo. Sounds a lot like Yu-Gi-Oh, but it's not related. It's time to do, 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 do. Anyway, it would apparently be able to vaporize someone from miles away using electrically charged particles. Tesla claimed that his version, which he called Teleforce, would be able to shoot down aircraft from over 200 miles away. But it would require so much power and so much force, some 60 million volts, that it was pretty much just a pipe dream thought of by a genius who was really into pigeons. Japan's Kugo didn't go much better. After years of development, their death ray could kill a rabbit from a thousand yards away if it were pointed at it for more than five minutes, which is pretty good if the Japanese were fighting rabbits. Unfortunately for them, their enemy was in the process of developing something called the atomic bomb. The power of which is a lot like harnessing the power of Magellan TV. It's an explosion of great documentary content where you can find just about everything you need to know about World War II. The Japanese might have been good at laser beaming rabbits, but Magellan TV is even better at beaming quality history docs right into whatever device you're streaming on. You want to learn about every important battle during the war and the strategies behind them? You can check out Battles Won and Lost.
That's an eight-part series that dives into all the pivotal clashes during the war and their significance. Or stream any of the other countless documentaries on the most devastating war in human history. You can also take a tour of all the battles and countries that Korean soldier Yang Kyun Jong fought in. The possibilities are endless, and with more than 20 hours of content added each week and no ads, Magellan TV should really be your go-to service for everything history-related, but also for science and nature docs, true crime, and a lot more. Start your free one-month trial today that can be accessed at try.magellantv.com slash nuttyhistory. Just enter the promo code nuttyhistory and check out battles won and lost and all the other great history docs that are available. The Man Who Saved Kyoto Imagine wanting to destroy a city because the people there were considered intellectuals and would appreciate the new technology. When deciding which cities in Japan should get hit with their new destructive atomic toy, Uncle Sam's army and company held a series of meetings, debating the strategic pros and cons of leveling entire urban centers. Kyoto was high up on the list, at first anyway. Nuking it was described in a committee report in the following way. From the psychological point of view, there is the advantage that Kyoto is an intellectual center for Japan and the people there are more apt to appreciate the significance of such a weapon as the gadget. Kyoto has the advantage of the people being more highly intelligent and hence better able to appreciate the significance of the weapon. It's like saying a smart kid in school would appreciate a new way to be bullied just because he was smart. But instead of bullying, we're talking about leveling an entire city. Kyoto was and is one of Japan's most important cultural centers. It's home to 17 World Heritage Sites and over 2,000 Buddhist temples. It had remained mostly untouched during the war, unlike other Japanese cities that had been bombed to bits. And the fact that it was untouched made it an appealing target. Why drop an atomic bomb on a city that's already mostly destroyed? But the Secretary of War, Henry Simpson, would have none of it. He insisted that Kyoto be taken off the list and had several discussions with President Truman about it. The exact reasoning behind Simpson's defense of Kyoto is unclear. He mentioned preserving the cultural heritage of the city. He would also visited Kyoto while serving as Governor General of the Philippines, and apparently had really liked it. But he also brought up geopolitical reasons for not bombing Kyoto. In his journal, he wrote that bombing important cities like Kyoto or Tokyo would create a deep resentment towards the red, white, and blue and pushed Japan right into the arms of the Soviets. I guess he was right. Norway helped avert Armageddon Ever wonder what would have happened if Hitler got his hands on a nuclear bomb? We well, might not be around right now if he did, and he almost did. The reason he didn't can be chalked up to a small group of Norwegian commandos who pulled off a mission crazier than any James Bond movie. It's a story full of espionage, a top-secret military base, and gun-toting soldiers skiing down mountains in the middle of the night. In 1934, Norway built the Vermark hydroelectric power plant. It was used to produce something called heavy water, which was then mixed with something called heavy high-fructose corn syrup and sold to American salt drink companies to help trigger the obesity crisis. No, that's not what happened. Heavy water is really just, well, heavier water. Heavy at the atomic level, anyway. The hydrogen atoms in heavy water weigh a bit more than the hydrogen atoms in a glass of water. The two look the same in liquid form, but if you freeze some heavy water in an ice cube tray and dump a few cubes into a drink, they will sink. Heavy water is important here because it's a good medium for splitting atoms in nuclear fission to turn unrefined uranium into weapons-grade plutonium. The U.S. was busy using refined uranium and didn't need heavy water, but the Nazis saw an opportunity. When they invaded Norway in 1940, they took over the plant and got to work trying to make some city-destroying weapons. So, in 1942, Norwegian and British special forces tried to infiltrate the power plant and destroy the supply of heavy water. It didn't work out so well. The plane the troops flew into the area crashed, and the survivors were found by the Gestapo, tortured, and then executed. They didn't give up, though. In February 1943, a damn cold, dark time of the year up in Scandinavia, a team of ski-clad commandos parachuted down near the power plant, skied up to it, and broke in with the help of a spy on the inside. They placed timed explosives by the heavy water supplies and then snuck out before anyone noticed. No one lost their lives on either side during the sabotage, and the Germans couldn't recover in time and develop the bomb before they were defeated in 1945. Do you have any other wild facts about World War II? Let us know in the comments, and don't forget to like and subscribe for more Nutty History. And don't forget to head over to Magellan TV, using our special offer to stream all kinds of stuff about not just history, but about the exploration of our universe.
the drama of the animal kingdom, and a lot more. All of it's in 4K with no ads. Go to try.magellantv.com slash nuttyhistory to start your free trial.